Well, good morning. Unfortunately, one of the things we're going to do today is to eliminate some of the hype on quantum computing. It's an exciting topic, but there is an unbelievable amount of disinformation out there that is just shocking. Let's start with what most experts believe. Now, I'm going to later talk to you about some people who disagree, but most experts believe that quantum computing will be a practical reality within the next decade. We'll talk about different opinions a little later. Well, what does that mean for security? Well, to put it bluntly and simply, all your current public key or asymmetric cryptography algorithms are based on factoring numbers or discrete logarithm problems. Even elliptic curve is just a discrete logarithm with reference to an elliptic curve. Quantum computers can solve these problems really, really well, and classical computers cannot. So what that means is if we had a practical, workable quantum computer today, all the cryptography used in e-commerce, online banking, booking your hotel room or whatnot, would be totally insecure and totally breakable. So that's kind of a big concern. It all started with Richard Feynman. Now, if you don't know who he is, I would not share that information. You'll embarrass yourself. Go Google him. A uh, great physicist, Nobel laureate. He never actually worked on quantum computers. He simply introduced the concept. And he was of such prominence that when he simply mentioned, hey, could we use quantum physics to make a computer? People listened and went to town on it. That kind of goes to what our host said about networking. He didn't actually develop the idea. He made a comment to someone and people started a whole new branch of computer science based on his comment. So listen very carefully to the comments you hear from your colleagues today. Here's the issue. Now I give you a complete quote from a really awesome article that appeared in Physics Today approximately two years ago. Basically, anything you can do with a classical computer you can do with a quantum computer once we have one, but not all things are a good idea. In other words, the first myth we're going to eliminate is that quantum computers are better at everything. No, they're not. Now, it happens that things like factoring and discrete logarithm, they're really, really good at. But as an example, there is zero indication that a quantum computer would be better at sorting algorithms than a classical computer. So if what you wanted to do was sort large data sets, go ahead and use your regular classical computer. It'll do it just fine. There's no reason to go to quantum. So a lot of people like to say that quantum computing will change everything. No, it won't. Now, it will profoundly change some things, such as cryptography and cybersecurity, but it's not going to change everything. Peter Shore is perhaps the Mick Jagger of the quantum computing world, the ultimate rock star, because he created an algorithm named Shor's algorithm, that proved that a quantum computer can factor a large number into its prime factors much faster than classical. In fact, the time he gave was log of n, n being the size of the prime number. Now, what's interesting here is classical computers can't do that. And if you're not familiar with the algorithm for RSA, for example, it's really pretty simple math. In fact, about 10 years ago, I was teaching that algorithm to a cryptography class. And I saw a student suddenly get that aha look. You could almost see the light bulb floating over his head. And he announced, that's elementary school math. Yes, yes it is. With very little exceptions, most of RSA is elementary school math. If we had a means to efficiently factor a large number into its prime factors today, RSA would be dead. But classical computers can spend for months and months and months and months to do that. Quantum computers would essentially be able to do it in a matter of weeks. It still wouldn't be instant, but it would be too fast for RSA to be useful. Now later, he and others came back and did the exact same thing with discrete logarithm, which affects Diffie-Hellman and all those permutations of it, like MQV and El-Gamal. El it affects all those different elliptic curve variations. So basically, he showed that every public key or asymmetric algorithm we have today would be highly vulnerable to quantum computing-based attacks. Now, I'm not gonna make you 
take a test afterwards on the math. There won't be any real math in this presentation. I'm just giving you Schrodinger's equation for those of you that have more math and want to delve into it. But basically, quantum physics is largely probabilistic. So let me give you the first hopeful note. We've disabused you of one myth that quantum computing can do everything. Let's give you a hopeful note. Later, we're going to talk about people who don't think we're going to succeed at quantum computing. And they're prominent people. They're not crackpots. Let's say they're right. Then is all this work in quantum computing, post-quantum cryptography, is it worthless? No. One of the areas I'm delving into deeply now is quantum-based information theory. Whether we ever have a practical quantum computer or not, it's my opinion at least, this is just Chuck's opinion, feel free to disagree with it, it's my opinion that quantum-based information theory is a lot better approach to real-world problems than traditional information theory because of the probabilistic nature. I think of all the real-world problems we encounter, and almost nothing is deterministic. Everything is a probability. So why don't we do our math and our information theory based on probable? Well, because none of the people who pay us like to hear that answer. They don't like us to hear, well, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> that really doesn't help, particularly if you're a consultant, but it's a real-world answer. There are very few def definitive answers. I'm not going to read every one of these, but I want to give you a few highlights. 1994 was when Peter Shore first produced his algorithm, and he proved that if quantum computing becomes a reality, cybersecurity is in big, big trouble. Now, a few other highlights. 1998, Los Alamos and MIT they propagated the first qubit, and they actually used a chemical method, a solution of amino acids. So that illustrates that how we actually store data is really irrelevant. You can do it in a biological substrate. You could do it in a chemical substrate. And I'm loath to bring science fiction into this, but the reboot of the old series Battlestar Galactica had the Cylons were basically biological-based computers. That's not impossible. Now, I'm not suggesting we're going to be invaded anytime soon. That's, that's not the point of that. The Institute of Quantum Optics and Quantum Information at the University of Inchuk, if I'm pronouncing that right, in Austria, developed the first qubyte, 8 bits. 2006, we get our first 12-bit quantum computer. Yale University created the first quantum processor in 2009. Now, let's jump forward a little to get a little sooner. 2015, D-Wave Systems announced that they had broken the 1,000 qubit barrier. We're going to talk about D-Wave a little later. It's not a true quantum computer, which is why they have a lot larger numbers than everyone else. 2017, IBM unveiled, unveils a 17 qubit system. 2018, Intel has a 49 qubit superconducting test chip. We get all the way to the most recent. 2019, just about a month and a half ago, IBM unveils a commercial quantum computer. It's 20 qubit. Now let's pause right there. The second thing I'm going to disabuse you of is the notion that we currently have practical working quantum computers. And I've stated this, I gave up on social media, by the way, and this is one of the reasons, arguments that uh, imbued over things like this and frankly, I had a difficult time restraining myself from going full Sheldon Cooper, if you're familiar with Big Bang Theory, on these, uh, these topics, because people would say things that were nonsense. I had people proudly saying, well, IBM has a quantum computer today. Not really. First of all, 20 qubits isn't that much data. It's not. And most people say, unless we have 1,000 to 100,000 qubits, you don't have anything a computer scientist could use. Now, for a physicist, this is an amazing breakthrough, and I'm deeply impressed. For an engineer, this is an amazing breakthrough, and I'm deeply impressed. For a data scientist, what kind of data are you going to keep in 20 qubits? Uh, not much. Second problem we have is they don't maintain state very long. Literally, most of these systems maintain state for a fraction of a second. Now, again, if you're a physicist or an engineer, that's an amazing accomplishment. If you're working with data, can you set up a data store and interact with it in a second? Probably not. There's not much you can do there. Now, the biggest problem 
is controlling or removing decoherence. Bottom line is these things tend to fall apart. They decohere really, really fast. Now, right now, the solution has been supercooling. We're talking about temperatures of three to five degrees Kelvin. If you're not remembering the Kelvin scale from your chemistry years ago, we're talking about around 270 below zero centigrade. I don't know about you, but I can't maintain that temperature in my home office. And if I could, my electric bill would bankrupt me within a day. So even if we can do it at super cool levels, that's not practical. And even at super cool, right now, we're only able to maintain that state, in some cases for milliseconds, in some cases for a second or two. Now these are great achievements, and if you reflect on the history of classical computers, think about where they were in the 1950s. They were huge, the size of a room, and you could probably do better with a pen and paper than you could with a classical computer, but they eventually got better. A uh, famous story when uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak first developed their first home-based computer, Steve Wozniak worked for Hewlett Packard at the time. They didn't make computers then, they made copiers and they made typewriters. And he told Steve Jobs, we have a problem. My contract says any invention I have, I have to present to my employer and they get first crack. Well, Steve Jobs was uh, mercurial to say the least and he reacted very hostily. Well, Steve Wozniak goes into his boss and his boss literally looks at him and says, why would ordinary people want a computer? We're not interested in this. So I say that to indicate that whereas quantum computing hasn't gone far right now, well, if we go back a few decades, classical computing had not, but it has now. Now, some of the hype, some of this was added literally to these slides yesterday because some things broke this week. No, physicists in Russia did not reverse time with a quantum computer. I saw tons of headlines that said quantum computer reverses time. What actually happened is they were able to return to a previous state. Now that's actually a big deal in quantum computing because as we'll see in a moment, everything's so probabilistic, once we move on, we can't get back. So it was a great achievement and it may be one of the forerunners of getting us practical computing, but no, we didn't move through time. A similar thing happened several years ago, and it was Scientific American that did this. Prominent magazine very much upset me. Their cover story said, scientists have achieved teleportation. Now, I grew up on the original Star Trek with Captain Kirk and all that, and I thought, beam me up, Scotty, let's go. I have to travel a lot. This is going to be a lot better than going to the airport. I'll just beam to wherever I want to go. What they really meant is we exchanged a single bit through quantum entanglement across the space of a lab. So the hype. The second one, I already mentioned, do we have working quantum computers? Sort of, but not at a point you can do anything with. We have it at a point where physicists can experiment. You're not likely to go into your favorite electronics store next year and purchase a quantum computer. Now you are very likely to f purchase a computer that has the name quantum in it somewhere. Um, I had the occasion of buying a new TV last year and luckily my son was home for a visit and went with me and restrained me because the salesman first told me about his television's quantum properties and I was like, do you even know what a Hermitian conjugate is? Then you don't know what quantum is. And then he said, well, let's look at this one that has nanotechnology. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Ultimately, by the way, instead of using three values to contain color, it uses four values, and that's what he called nanotechnology. But yeah, you're gonna see the hype, but you won't see the reality. Will it revolutionize everything? No, as we already said, there are some things that just aren't done any better in a quantum computer. And if I have to put all this money into this very intricate system and supercooling, but my laptop will do it the same, then use the laptop. Now, I have to bring up this. My issue of IEEE Spectrum came to me Monday or Tuesday, I forget which, but the main article is Mikhail Diakonov, if I'm pronouncing that right. He's a professor of physics and very well known in the quantum computing world and the quantum physics world. He had an entire article where he's arguing we're never going to get there. The underlying quantum physics, we will never be able to solve decoherence. Now again, most experts disagree with him and there was a second article in the same issue that was saying he was wrong and we need more research. 
I only bring this up for two reasons. One, he's the most vocal, but he's not the only one, who are not crackpots. Uh, just because some crazy person posts something on Facebook doesn't mean I'll take it seriously. But when prominent physicists are explaining that they have a problem with this, you have to at least listen. And right now, no one wants to talk about that. We want to talk about how cool quantum computing will be and how it will be here next week. And that gets a lot of interest. But it's important to realize there are hurdles that may or may not be overcome. Now, I have to be frank. In my opinion, he's wrong. He's very brave to say all this, and he has very good arguments. But human beings have a history of overcoming things that we were told we couldn't. Uh, the week before the Wright brothers flew, at that time they called it the War Department, not the Defense Department. But the War Department had just ended a very expensive project to develop airplanes. And they had determined with the best minds in the country that it's just not possible. We've poured a lot of money into a hole. And the next week, a couple of guys with a bicycle shop flew. So that kind of thing happens in history all the time. You never know what innovative spark someone's going to have that might overcome these issues. And given the huge number of people working on this and the huge amount of money, seems to me likely we will overcome it. But I wanted to let you know there are other valid, qualified expert voices on this matter. Now, let's talk a little bit about what quantum computers are, why they work. First of all, the basic unit is called a qubit, not a bit. And it's very simple. A bit gives you a one or a zero. And whether you measure it or not, the bits on that laptop right now have a one or a zero, period. A qubit, once you measure it, will give you a one or zero. But in the meantime, it can maintain any superposition of one or zero. Now, if you think about it, how many values are between one and zero? Infinite. 0 0.1, 0 0.1111, 0 0.1119, infinite. That's why they usually represent it as a sphere with a zero on one end and a one on the other and we compute the probability of getting a one or a zero out the other end. So because of this, they can do some things really well. When it comes to factoring, they can maintain an infinite number of states until you measure them. That's why they factor a lot faster, because they're able to basically, I'm oversimplifying this, so forgive me, they're basically able to think about a lot more options before they give you the answer. So this is the essence of what makes quantum computing Cool. Now, how do we store them? Ions have been the most popular way because you already have a charged atom. It's not that big a deal to try to store something in that charge. But we have a problem with that. If you remember elementary physics or chemistry that most of you probably took a long time ago, atoms don't like to stay in that state very long. They like to pair up with someone else and neutralize. Uh, Table salt is the sodium and the chloride saying, hey, I don't like being charged. Let's kind of bond together here and even this out. So it's kind of hard to maintain that state. However, newer approaches, and we're back to that same physics paper, have been using neutral atoms. This is harder to do, but has a much better chance of being stable because of the nature of the neutral atom itself is more stable. I'm personally hopeful, although I don't know anyone doing this now, that they'll start looking at inert gases because those are very, very stable. And if we can manage to store data in there, the likelihood of overcoming decoherence is, is a lot higher. Now, this is basically what the D-Wave computer is doing, quantum annealing. And they actually borrowed this concept from blacksmiths for hundreds of years. The, what they do is they superheat a metal as hot as they can then let it slowly cool. The heating and then the slow cooling leads to harder metal. That's the essence of metallurgy, of blacksmithing back to the Middle Ages. Well, what you do in quantum annealing is you basically have a problem where we have a limited number of possible outcomes, and we know what they are. And we start with all the possible states equally weighted, then it evolves to the state we're looking for, evolves to the answer we're looking for. It's called quantum annealing. And that's what the D-Wave people do. Uh, I know NASA has uh, one of these because about a year and a half ago I was giving a similar talk and there was a guy from NASA there that wanted to speak to me afterwards. Um, basically, D-Wave systems have quantum-like computers. And if you have, well, a few million dollars, you can actually purchase one of these. 
Uh, they're not cheap, but they will, they will sell you one. So back to the practical issue. What is the problem for cybersecurity? We touched on this briefly earlier, but let's return to it. We have a problem. What if that article in the IEEE spectrum is wrong? And next month or next year, someone announces, hey, I've got a practical quantum computer. We need to have alternative cryptographic algorithms already in place. Now, I don't know how many of you follow cryptography, but let's dismiss quantum computing for just a moment. Most of your public key algorithms are really, really old. RSA was first publicly described in 1977, Diffie-Hellman in 1976. I'm looking around this room, there's a substantial number of people that weren't born yet. Now, I'm a big fan of antique furniture, antique books, but not antique computing. We need newer things. And if you want to, after this, at your next break, simply open up your computer, except for those of you doing the, the no computing thing, go not to Google, but to Google Scholar, and type in any variation of RSA cracked, RSA broken, anything like that, you'll see thousands and thousands of entries because every couple of years, someone cracks the current RSA key and that's why your vendor tells you you need a bigger key. So even without quantum computing, the bigger and bigger key is only an answer for so long. At some point, we have to have a better algorithm. And because, as we said, all of these algorithms are based on problems that quantum computers can solve, but frankly, classical computers are getting there. And frankly, cloud computing is an issue. When I can put not one computer, but 1,000 computers to the task of cracking your RSA, I'm going to crack it. Whether it takes a month or two months is irrelevant, I will crack it. Now, fortunately, the US National Institute of Standards started a process and they were accepting submissions for post-quantum algorithms. Uh, if you're wanting to join in too late, first round's over. They do have, if you look it up on the internet, they do have all of the algorithm source code that have been submitted. Now, the problem I have with the NIST approach is this. They're doing the same thing they did with AES. They want to be too fair. So they've opened the door to anyone who wants to submit an algorithm. And the first round had some wonderful, wonderful algorithms. It also had some, mis some submissions that I believe ended people's careers. Because if anyone sees your algorithm you submitted, they go, you're not a cryptographer. Not even close. You probably shouldn't even say the word cryptography. So there were some really bad things they have to sort through. But they're taking a multi-year study to sort through all of these algorithms they expect to be done in 2022 and to have an algorithm ready to go that they've picked as the post-quantum standard. Now, I did my own study on this, a paper that was just presented at an IEEE conference in January, should be out in IEEE Explore in the next several weeks. I looked at various lattice-based algorithms. They're based on a totally different math, not factoring, not discrete logarithm, they're based on lattices, and I give you a little math down there, a description of a lattice. And there are several different problems they use. They use the shortest vector problem. They use the closest vector problem. And most of these, if you think about the lattices you see in a linear algebra textbook, seem trivial, because in a textbook they give you a matrix that's maybe six by six. That's so it will fit in the book. You can have a matrix that's a billion by a billion, and then a million dimensions. If I do that, then finding the closest or the shortest vector is no longer a trivial problem. It's, it's very difficult. Learning with errors. This I wanted to be my favorite. I'm going to admit to a bias I had when I did this study, and I turned out to be wrong. They borrowed this from machine learning, and I love that idea because I think we're too often siloed. You know, I do this, and I don't know about that. Someone said, let's take machine learning and apply it to cryptography, and they created the learning with errors problem based cryptography, and they used algebraic rings to do it. I wanted that to be the most efficient just because of its interdisciplinary nature. Uh, my own study didn't support that, unfortunately. The GGH algorithm, another lattice base that's been around for quite a while, we find the vector in the lattice that's closest to a chosen vector V. Again, that sounds simple, unless we look at really big lattices. <coughs> NTRU, uh, it was first invented by Hofstein, Pfeiffer, and Silverman. It's been shown to be resistant to Shor's algorithm. Now, since Shor's algorithm got this whole conversation started, probably a good idea to start with showing you're resistant to it. 
Now, ultimately, I looked at these four different algorithms, and I'll save you the suspense. You don't even have to go find the paper from IEEE. NTRU, on every basis, turned out to be the most secure, uh, based on several different avenues of test. And I'm very pleased to admit it is one of the contestants for the NIST standard. So I'm eagerly awaiting to see what NIST finds out, because if they come to the same conclusion I did, I will champion that as validation. If they come to a different conclusion, I will never mention this publicly again. <laughs> so NTRU appears to be robust. And guess what? It could be a replacement for RSA today. We don't have to wait for quantum computers. It could be used today. So what can you do with all this? Well, let's start with one more issue. And I'm probably taking someone's question away from Q&A. Who is most far along to developing quantum computers? That's an easy answer, Chinese. The Chinese government is pouring a fortune into this, and they're doing a great job. I also happen to be a reviewer for some IEEE journals, and just in the past month, I've gotten papers, I obviously can't give you the details because they're not published yet, from Chinese universities that are going to IEEE journals that have made some amazing advances, particularly in quantum key distribution. They have taken this to a whole new level. And they simply got on the bandwagon before Europe or US or Russia did, and they put more money into it. So what can you do? Well, if you have no interest in focusing your research in this area or simply don't have the mathematical background, I think pushing whatever country you're from, the government, to put more money into this is a national security issue. Because I'm going to make a prediction. If the Chinese do break this problem and have a working quantum computer, they're not going to publicly announce it. In fact, I expect the opposite public announcement. I expect we had a big problem, the approach we were using collapsed, we have to start all over again. If I hear that in the news, that's my clue that they actually fixed the problem and they're reading all of our encrypted communication as if it were published in the New York Times. That's a real national security issue. We need, every country needs to be on board. Explore alternatives to current cryptography. You don't have to be a physicist or have access to quantum computers to look at lattice-based algorithms. And you get some of the source code off the internet off the NIST website. So if you basically have mathematics through introductory calculus and linear algebra, you could start examining, doing your own testing of algorithms. It's a great place to publish some research. Now, if you want to dive deeper, the other article in this week's IEEE Spectrum was simply arguing that we just don't have enough people doing quantum research, whether it be the actual physics, whether it be the information theory, whether it be the cryptography, whatever. They were arguing more people need to turn their research here. And I have to confess, last April I was doing a talk like this at UT uh, Dallas, University of Texas Dallas, and I was kind of blown away because a PhD student came up to me afterwards and actually said he was changing his dissertation topic based on this. And I was like, wow, I hope you still graduate. I hope I didn't, I hope I didn't lead you down a path that now I hear from you three years from now, I can't graduate because I changed my topic. But it was kind of flattering. Conclusions. It's probably coming and nobody knows when. Experts say 10 years, some experts say 15, some say never. So I don't know. If I knew the answer to all of these problems, then I would be in Stockholm later this year to pick up my Nobel. And just to be sure, there's nobody here from the Nobel Committee, right? And just checking, it could be a much nicer day than I thought. We need to have cryptographic solutions in place, ready to implement if it happens, when it happens, and even if it doesn't. I'm sorry, 40 and 50 year old cryptography, hey, let's move on. There are better ideas. And not to take anything away from the inventors of RSA or elliptic curve, I think, frankly, the men involved were flat out geniuses. But we have learned something in the intervening decades, and it's time to move to better stuff. Even should quantum computing tarry, many of these algorithms could be more secure in our current computers, right here, right now. So I believe we turn it over to questions. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Chuck Easton. And